Hello, my name is David Ewan from the Resurrection Center, and I'm going to talk to you about five books of the Bible. This is part of our Bible 101 series that we're having at the Resurrection Center located on Worcester Street in the Indian Orchard area of Springfield. Here are the five books I'll be talking about. Uh, number one, Ecclesiastes. Number two, Solomon. Number three, Isaiah. Number four, Jeremiah. Number five, Lamentations. I'll tell you about the first book, Ecclesiastes. It's a philosophical exploration of the meaning of life. It discusses the meaning of life and the best way of life. Uh, the book of Solomon is really a love song or a collection of love songs, and we'll be talking about that soon. And it's celebrating love, desire, and marriage. Uh, number three, Isaiah. Uh, God sends the prophet Isaiah to warn Israel of future judgment, but he also uh, tells them about the coming of a king, and that's Jesus, and a servant who will bear the sins of many. Uh, the next book we'll talk about is Jeremiah. God sends a prophet to warn Israel about the coming Babylonian captivity, but the people don't take the news very well. And then we talk about the book of Lamentations. It's a collection of dirges. Dirges are songs of mourning. Uh, and what that does, it's uh, lamin, uh, laments the fall of Jerusalem after the Babylonian attacks. So let's talk about uh, Ecclesiastes. So Ecclesiastes, it's a philosophical exploration of the meaning of life. The book of Ecclesiastes discusses the meaning of life and the best way of life. It shares reflections of a philosopher known as the preacher. The teachings and biblical history give understanding that this was written by Solomon, a fabulously wealthy and wise king of Israel who succeeded his father, King David. So here's the role of Ecclesiastes in the Bible. It's the fourth book of poetry in the Bible, and that follows uh, Job, Psalms, and Proverbs. While Psalms is a collection of songs and Proverbs is a collection of principles, Ecclesiastes is one long-form poetic discourse. It poses one main question at the beginning and spends the next 12 chapters arriving at an answer. The question, what is life? So the purpose of Ecclesiastes is to spark future generations the suffering and misery, misery I should say, of seeking after foolish, meaningless, materialistic emptiness and to offer wisdom by discovering truth in seeking after God. So why is Ecclesiastes so important? With Solomon as the author of the book, we know it uh, had to have been written sometime before his death in 931 BC. The content of Ecclesiastes reflects someone looking back on a life that was long on experience but short on lasting rewards. As king, he had the opportunity and resources to pursue the rewards of wisdom, pleasure, and work in and of themselves. Yet the world-weary tone of the writing suggests that late in life, he looked back on his folly with regret, pointing us to a better, simpler life lived in light of God's direction. So Ecclesiastes describes life. And what it does is it pre presents us a naturalistic vision of life, one that sees life through distinctively human eyes, but ultimately recognizes the role and reign of God in the world. This more humanistic quality has made the book especially popular among younger audiences today, men and women who have seen more than their fair share of pain and instability in life, but who still cling to the hope in God. Ecclesiastes shows us a man who lived through this process and came out on the other side with a wiser, more seasoned perspective. When we're surrounded by the temptation to proclaim life's ultimate emptiness, we can find in Ecclesiastes a vision tempered by experience and ultimately seen through divine colored lenses. Life is destined to remain unsatisfying apart from our recognition of God's intervention. It only remains to be seen whether or not we will place our trust in his sure and able hands. The first portion of Ecclesiastes explore man's situation on earth, and the situation isn't too great. For example, 
Uh, one is the smarter you get, the harder it is to cope with the world. Number two, pleasure and riches do not satisfy. The next one, wise men and fools die alike. After that, you can't take the results of your hard work with you when you die. And the next one is what you leave behind goes to a generation who didn't earn it. And after that, the results of your labor don't really satisfy your desires either. And after that, people practice evil instead of justice. And that's followed by even obedience to God doesn't guarantee a long, happy life. And that is followed by, and the wicked sometimes get away with it. So why is the world this way? What can we do about it? What's the point? Well, he's sure that there is a just God. He's seen him with his own eyes. But the world doesn't always reflect God's justice. So the preacher explains what man can do to enjoy life, even if God's works are not apparent. For example, Eat, drink, and enjoy life because you're in the hand of God. Work hard and use wisdom while you can. Avoid acts of foolishness, especially when dealing with authority. Take chances, pursue opportunities, enjoy life while you can. As you live, remember who made you. So the conclusion, it ends with, when all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Now we're going to talk about the Book of Solomon. It's considered a love song or a collection of love songs celebrating love, desire, and marriage. Um, Solomon was probably best known as the king who built the first Jewish temple around 957 BC. He was also known for his great wisdom and riches. From the Hebrew name, uh, which is derived from uh, peace, uh, Solomon was a king of Israel, the son of David, and Bathsheba. God ordained that Solomon would be the successor to the throne, despite not being the oldest son. Solomon sought God's help to be a good king, and God blessed him with riches, fame, and a long life because he was pleased with Solomon's request. Despite all God's blessings, Solomon still made bad choices that affected his people. The Judgment of Solomon is a story from the Hebrew Bible in which King Solomon of Israel ruled between two women, both claiming to be the mother of a child. Solomon revealed their true feelings and relationships to the child by suggesting to cut the baby in two, with each woman to receive half. So the real mother was willing to give up the baby to protect the baby. Solomon reigned for 40 years before dying and being buried in Jerusalem. In his final years, he had lost his zeal for God, and the kingdom became an empty shell for its former glory. He was succeeded by a son who would lead the kingdom into further decay and destruction. Solomon is the last ruler of a united kingdom of Israel. He dies of natural causes. We learn from Solomon two main points. First, when we seek God's will, God will provide a way for it to be accomplished whether it is wisdom, provision, protection, or preference. We can learn that when God is for us, nothing can prevail against us. Second, we can learn that despite God's provision for our salvation, wants, and needs, we can also still make bad choices because we still have fleshly desires while we live on this earth. These fleshly desires will constantly want to rebel against what God tells us. In the book of Genesis, when God made Adam and Eve, he brought them together as husband and wife. Adam recognized Eve as bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. The Song of Solomon, also known as the Song of Songs, celebrates this kind of union, a man and a woman becoming one. It's a ballad of love and longing. It's an exchange of love notes. It's a story of adoration, satisfaction, delight, and sexual desire. It's the tale of a young woman preparing to marry her love, a handsome gent who adores her. They describe their emotions, their passions, their appearances, their fears. They vulnerably display their love and desire for one another, sometimes rather graphically. Uh, So the Book of Solomon is arranged by character. There are three parties join the song, the bride, the groom, the chorus. 
So the bride um, is a hardworking shepherd girl with a rough home life. The groom, a handsome and stately shepherd. The text doesn't explicit, explicitly say whether or not Solomon is the bridegroom, but the bride does reference Solomon's wedding parade. Uh, the chorus, uh, the community of people celebrating the bride and bridegroom's love and union. If this were an ind- indeed an arranged song, song, I should say, think of it as a duet with a choir. And this song has three general movements. Uh, the bride and groom prepare for the wedding. The bride and groom profess their desire for one another. And the bride and groom are finally united. So Solomon gives us a biblical look at human love. The characters experience attraction, love sickness, and what seems like a pretty great wedding night. In fact, the book has almost a secular feel. God is never directly mentioned in the original Hebrew. The closest we get to a mention of God is in the last chapter when the bride compares jealous love to a blazing flame. That Hebrew word for flame literally means flame of the Lord, but could just mean an especially hot fire. Okay, now uh, we're going to go to our third book of discussion. We're going to talk about Isaiah. So Isaiah was a Hebrew prophet who was believed to have lived about 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Born in Jerusalem, Israel, he was said to have found his calling as a prophet when he saw a vision in the year of King Uzziah's death. Isaiah prophesies the coming of Messiah, Jesus Christ. God sends the prophet Isaiah to warn Israel of future judgment, but also to tell them about a coming king and servant who will bear the sins of many. So what is Isaiah's role in the Bible? Well, Isaiah is the first of major prophets. When God had a message for the people, he spoke to them through prophets, men moved by the Holy Spirit to speak on God's behalf. Isaiah is the only major prophet whose story takes place before the fall of Jerusalem. While Jeremiah and Ezekiel prophesy about these events before and while they happen, Isaiah looks into the future to see Judah's Babylonian captivity. Isaiah's most famous prophecies, however, concern Jesus. No other prophet is referenced in the New Testament as much as Isaiah. Isaiah preaches of the coming king who will rule Israel and the nations in justice and peace. He also looks forward to a special servant of God, one who will fulfill all Israel's duties and bear their sins. (laughs) <laughs> the nation of Israel has long been split into two nations, north and south, Israel and Judah. They weathered wars against each other and the surrounding nation for a few hundred years, but neither kingdom can stand through the storms to come. The Assyrians are rising in power, and the Babylonians will overthrow them in time. And the people had remained faithful to their God, and so their security as a nation cannot last. The north will fall soon. The south will fall later. God raises up the prophet Isaiah to tell the people this message. But by God's grace, the message doesn't end there. Yes, God is going to bring the Assyrians against the north. He will bring the Babylonians against the Assyrians. He will send the south into exile in Babylon. He will bring the Persian Cyrus against the Babylonians, Babylonians, I should say. But he will also bring Israel back home. He will also rule Israel as Emmanuel, God with us. He will judge Israel's enemies and bring all the nations to himself too. And somehow a mysterious servant will bear the sins of many, reconciling Israel and the world to the Lord. And that's Jesus. That's Isaiah's message. God's judgment is coming, but so is his comfort. And the last book that I'll talk about is, or no, the second to last, I should say, Jeremiah, number four, uh, four out of five, Jeremiah I'll be talking about. So let's talk about Jeremiah's role in the Bible. Jeremiah is the second of the major prophets. When God had a message for the people, he spoke to them through prophets, men moved by the Holy Spirit to speak God's words. Jeremiah is also the longest book of the Bible by word count in the original language. In his early ministry, Jeremiah was primarily a preaching prophet, preaching throughout Israel. He condemned idolatry, the greed of priests, and false prophets. 
Many years later, God instructed Jeremiah to write down these early oracles and his other messages. The difficulties he encountered as described in the books of Jeremiah and Lamentations have prompted scholars to refer to him as the weeping prophet. Jeremiah was called to prophetic ministry uh, around 626 BC to give prophecy of Jerusalem's destruction that would occur by invaders from the north. Jeremiah, whose activity spanned four of the most tumultuous decades in his country's history, appears to have received his call to be a prophet in the 13th year of the reign of King Hosea and continued his ministry until after the siege and capture of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Jeremiah's life and teachings had a profound effect on the future development of both Judaism and Christianity. In the New Testament, many passages indicate that both Jesus and Paul not only accepted certain ideas from Jeremiah, but gave them a central place in their own interpretations of the meaning of religion. For this reason, along with the other others, Jeremiah is often regarded as the greatest of Hebrew prophets. The period in which Jeremiah lived and worked was one of the most critical in Hebrew history. His public ministry began during the reign of King Hosea, which was about 640 B.C. to 609 B.C., and lasted until sometime after the fall of Jerusalem and the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, and for good reason. Jeremiah's message is heartbreaking. The people of God have forsaken him, and now he will destroy them. And even as Jeremiah preaches to the people, they do not listen. Jeremiah's tragic writings don't end in this book either. The Weeping Prophet is the traditional author of Lamentations, a collection of funeral songs of the mourning called Dirges for Jerusalem. We'll talk about that next. Jerusalem mixes prophetic discourse with narrative, and the narratives are not arranged chronologically. He speaks to kings, priests, and commanders, and the people and travels to many nations. As you read Jeremiah, you'll learn to anticipate Jeremiah's advice and the people's response, and you'll see just how many chances God gives his people to follow his voice and keep his covenant. But the covenant is is broken. The people are broken. And in Jeremiah, that we learn about God's plan to make a new covenant with his people, His law will be on our hearts and they will all know him. He shall be their God and they shall be his people. He will forgive their sin and remember it no more. God makes this covenant through Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The book of Hebrews explores this new covenant in detail. When the prophet Daniel reads the book of Jeremiah... He prays to the Lord on behalf of Israel and nicely sums up how the book fits into the rest of the Old Testament. Three things. The Jews are warned that this would happen in the law of Moses, but uh, the kings and rulers did not obey. They ignored the prophets. Although Jeremiah's message focuses on the coming punishment of Judah, the book is not without hope. Jeremiah promises restoration and return for the Jews, which comes to pass in the book of Ezra, Jeremiah also looks forward to a righteous king from the line of David to arise in the future. And although he has been born, the Lord Jesus Christ has yet to take office in Jerusalem. So here's an overview of the storyline. The temple of the Lord had stood in Jerusalem for more than 300 years. The nation was known by God's name. The surrounding nations had heard of the wonders of Israel's God had worked for them in Egypt, in the wilderness, and in their own land. Israel's God was a great God, and his throne was in Jerusalem. Yet they did not follow him. They worshipped other gods, perverted justice in the land, and ignored his laws. Once in a while, a king, a descendant of David, would return the people back to God. But the other kings led the people into all kinds of disobedience. The people have gone far enough, God promised to his exile. His people from their land, if they turn from him, and now Jerusalem's time has come. The Babylonians will destroy the city, raise the holy temple, and carry the Jews away. 
But even as Lord plans Jerusalem's destruction, he sends his people a prophet to warn, challenge, and comfort them. That prophet is a young man named Jeremiah. Jeremiah ministers to the Jews for about 40 years, and his career is a sad one. He is, for the most part, the only prophet of God in the land, and everyone else who claims to have a a word from the Lord is fake. That's especially difficult for Jeremiah because while the false prophets preach peace and safety and victory over Babylon, Jeremiah insists that the Babylonians will destroy everything. The false prophets tell everything that God is with his people. Jeremiah tells everyone that God is on the enemy's side. Uh, you can imagine which message is more popular. Jeremiah endures mockery, imprisonment, kidnapping, and death threats from the people he desperately tries to help. But God's word comes true. Okay, so the Jews are, uh, and I'm going to say the name, Nebuchadnezzar defeats the Jews and carries off the royal family. The temple is destroyed, the city is burned with fire, the Babylonians set up a new governor of the area and go back to their land. They also release Jeremiah from prison and tell him to live a happy life. But it doesn't end there. A neighboring nation with this, uh, nation assassinates the governor and the Jews are left with two options. Stay in their land or immigrate to Egypt as refugees. They ask Jeremiah what the Lord would have them do and he promises them that if they stay in the land of Israel, they will flourish. They will live in peace under Babylonian rule and God himself will have compassion on them. But if they disobey, God will bring the Babylonians against the Egyptians and the Jews will perish when Egypt is conquered. The Jews choose to go to Egypt anyways. So now I go to the last book, which is Lamentations, uh, uh, number five of five. Lamentations is a collection of dirges lamenting the fall of Jerusalem after the Babylonian attacks. When I say dirges, it's a song of mourning. Uh, From the dictionary, lamentation usually occurs when someone dies or a tragedy occurs. At the funeral, you can hardly hear the speaker above the wails of lamentation. Um, from the Latin, uh, lamenta, meaning weeping or wailing, lamentation means more than just shedding a few tears. Lamentation is when grief pours out. So the book of Lamentations is a reflection by the prophet Jeremiah on the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 586 BC with the subsequent Babylonian exile. While the poetry expressed pain and sorrow over the loss of Jerusalem, there is also an acceptance of punishment for the sins of Israel in their disregard for the way of the Lord. Finally, there's an expression of hope that God will one day provide deliverance from their chastisement. Each verse of the first four chapters begins with successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Chapter 3, having three lines for each letter. Lamentation sits in the major prophets section of our English Bibles. It follows the story of Jeremiah, who traditionally wrote Lamentations, but the poetic structure of the book clearly states it's more similar to the Psalms, Proverbs, and other wisdom type of literature. Uh, So here's what happens. The city of gods is in ruins. The temple is destroyed. The king's palace is in shambles. The gates are burned down. The walls are torn apart. The Babylonians have ransacked the whole city. How could that happen? Well, that's the original name of Lamentations, this small collection of five poems that mourn the fall of Jerusalem. According to the tradition, the prophet Jeremiah writes these dirges for the city he had ministered to for, for many years. And it all begins with the word, how? For example, in Lamentations 1.1, how lonely sits this city that was full of people. She has become like a widow who has once, who was once a great, I'm going to start again in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 1. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. She has become like a widow who was once great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a forced laborer. The book deals with the question, how could this happen? How could Jerusalem fall to the Babylonians? The answer has little to do with the political or military forces surrounding the events. Rather, the fall of Jerusalem is a spiritual event, 
one that happened by spiritual means, for spiritual reasons. The people had rejected their God and his prophets. Before they ever entered the promised land, Israel was given a choice, remain loyal to God and enjoy his blessings and prosperity or worship other gods and be exiled from their land. That's from Deuteronomy. Israel followed other gods, showed injustice to the poor, and ignored God's law. The people had sworn to love and obey and follow the Lord, and they broke that promise time and time again. But God is faithful and just, and he cannot let the guilty go unpunished. So Jerusalem falls, and all the people can do is mourn. The siege is unforgettable, but the reason it happened should never be forgotten. And the poetry in Lamentations is particularly memorable. You can't tell in English, but the Lamentations are intricate poems built around the Hebrew alphabet. But even in a book uh, named Lamentations, the God of Vengeance is still a God of hope. In the middle of the book, the writer reminds the people to hope in God. And so I'll read a couple of scriptures from Lamentations, both from chapter 3. I'll start with uh, verse 22 through 23. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And that's in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 through 23. Uh, that is followed by uh, my next scripture I'll read. Lamentations also from chapter 3, but the verse is 39 and 40. Why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? Let us examine and probe our ways, and let us return to the Lord. Again, that's Lamentations chapter 3, verse 39 and 40. So the city was destroyed and the people were exiled because of their sin. But even this opportunity to call on God for help, for the people of God, he is the only hope. So a quick outline of Lamentations. Uh, there's Jerusalem, punish and in pain. Number two, the Lord's anger on Jerusalem. Number three, the individual's distress turns to hope. Number four, the siege of Jer Jerusalem. And number five, a plea for God's mercy. So we've talked about five books as part of our Bible 101 discussion at the Resurrection Center. We talked about Ecclesiastes. It's a philosophical exploration of the meaning of life. The book of Ecclesiastes discusses the meaning of life and the best way of life. Next, number two, we talked about Solomon. It's a love song celebrating love, desire, and marriage. Then we talked about Isaiah, a prophet. See, God sends a prophet Isaiah to warn Israel of future judgment, but also to tell them about the coming of a king and servant who will bear the sins of many, and, and that's Jesus. Uh, in Jeremiah, uh, the fourth book we talked about today, God sends a prophet to warn Israel about the coming Babylonian captivity, but the people don't take the news very well. And number five, it's a collection of mourning songs or dirges lamenting the fall of Jerusalem after the Babylonian attacks. So these are the five books that we talked about. My name is David Ewan, and this is The Resurrection Center.